next song will be 503. If you'd like to go ahead and be opening your songbooks, 503. This is the first of the month, but we're going to wait until next week to have the men's business meeting. So not, not today. We'll probably wait till next week for that. Um, need to remember, continue to remember the uh, Gunters in our prayers as they are still on their uh, spring trip. I guess you would call it their spring trip. They're on their trip. Uh, they're out on the road. So, uh, and uh, other than that, I don't know of any other announcements. Um, Sunday morning Bible class, 5:30. 10.30 worship, and 6 o'clock in the evenings, and then 7 o'clock on Wednesday nights. All right, let's begin our worship here. 503. Swiftly we're turning, life's daily pages, swiftly the hours are changing to years, how are we using? God's golden moments, shall we reap glory, shall we reap tears? Into our hands the gospel is given, into our hands is given the light. Haste let us carry God's precious message. Guiding the erring back to the right. Millions are roving without the gospel. Quickly the uh, eternity's night. Shall we sit idly as they rush onward? Haste let us hold up Christ the true light. Into our hands the gospel is given. Into our hands is given the light. Haste let us carry God's precious message. Guiding the erring. Back to the right. Souls that are precious, souls that are dying, while we rejoice, our sins are forgiven. Did he not also die for these lost ones? Then let us point the way unto heaven. Into our hands the gospel is given, into our hands is given the light. Haste let us carry God's precious message, guiding the erring back to the right. 517. 517 before the opening prayer. The church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ her Lord. She is his new creation. By water and the word, from heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. He led from every Charter of salvation. 
Father, we thank you for another opportunity you've given us to be here together as your children, your servants, to humbly gather around your throne of grace to worship you in song, in prayer, in study of your word. We pray that our hearts and our minds are focused on worshiping you and the cares and the thoughts of this world are cast aside, that we can give you all the glory and honor that you deserve. Lord, we know that we might desire to be with you, but we know that we have work to do in this life, and we pray that we will always strive to study your word and prepare for that heavenly home as we walk this life, and we pray that we will remember those that are in our life that haven't obeyed you. We pray that we will strive to find every opportunity to teach them and not shy away from that responsibility. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you give us, our strength, our health, rain, sunshine, the blessing we have in this country to be able to worship you without any fear and especially your son Jesus, who has come to this earth to give us an example to live, but most importantly to die on that cruel cross to give us a hope of heaven. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. The next song will be 525. 525. Sing the first, second, and fourth verse of this song. If I walk in the pathway of duty, if I work till the close of the day, I shall see the great king in his beauty when I gone the last mile of the way. When I've gone the last mile of the way, I will rest at the close of the day. And I know there are joys that await me when I've gone the last mile of the way. If for Christ I proclaim the glad story, if I seek for his sheep gone astray, I am sure he will show me his glory when I'm gone the last mile of the way. When I'm gone the last mile of the way, I will rest at the close of the day. And I know there are joys that await me when I've gone the last mile of the way. And if here I have earnestly striven and have tried all his will to obey, twill enhance all the rapture of heaven when I've gone the last mile of the way. When I've gone the last mile of the way, I will rest at the close of the day. And I know there are joys that await me when I've gone the last mile of the way. If you'd like to mark your songbooks, the song of invitation will be 563. 563 will be the song of invitation after the lesson. And the song before the scripture reading will be 528. 528 before the scripture reading, which will be brought by Brother Steve, and then the lesson by Brother Charlie. I have found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand.
listen to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Oh, he all my griefs has taken, and all my sorrows borne. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken, and all my idols torn. From my heart, and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me, and Satan tempt me sore, through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here, while I live by faith and do his blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With his manna he my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory, to see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Thank you for the scripture reading there, Steve. Uh, welcome, everybody. Hi, everybody. We got the machine running there on the Internet? We guess. Okay. Well, you can tell I'm a, I'm a lay preacher, I guess you'd call the word or whatever. But uh, And I'm getting where I sat down when I preach. And I always said when a preacher has to sit down, he's too old to do the job anymore. But that's another story. Use what you got. Contentment. That's something we all would like to have. And many of us maybe look for it. Some of us, I don't think, even look for it because we wouldn't know what to do with it if we got it. Some people really don't seek to be content. Uh, let's go look at this. I've got a Bible story I want you to look at. Go to the book of Esther. This is kind of contentment, and this kind of looks at some of the way the world is today about contentment. This is the book of Esther. It occur, occurs during the uh, Persian reign, which is about 460, somewhere in there, B.C., 560, somewhere in that time frame with the Persians ruling over the area. Uh, Aharos is the uh, king of, this, of the Persians at this time, also known as Xerxes, and he was. we believe that's who this king is that is mentioned here. And go to Esther 3, 1 through 5. And this is about a guy named Haman. Esther 3. After these things did Aharaz appoint Haman, the son of Hamada, the Agadite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. Haman is promoted above everybody else. The only one on top of him is the king. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, 
for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did he reverence. Mordecai is a Jew here. He doesn't bow down to him. Verse, verse 3, Then the king's servants, which were in the gate, said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? We don't know what Mordecai's answer was that. Maybe he didn't, for whatever reason, maybe he didn't want to reverence a man when he thought maybe only God should be reverenced that way. But in verse 4, Now it came to pass when they speak, speak to him daily, he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand, for he had been told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then Haman was full of wrath. Simply because he wouldn't bow down to him, Haman's really mad and upset. What happens, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this story, what happens is that Haman devises a plot and tells the king, he said, you know, there's this group of people here within this vast empire. I believe it said if you had like 127 provinces that stretched from Ethiopia to India. And uh, he said, you know, there's a people in here and they don't serve you and we need to get rid of them, a diverse people. So the king issues a proclamation to kill them all. Well, let's go over to Esther 5. Now, the proclamation hasn't been issued yet. And one of the things about the proclamations of the Persian kings, once they issued them, they could not retract them. They could issue more proclamations, but that one could not be retracted. And that will be dealt with later. But uh, let's go to uh, Esther 5, 9 through 14. Now, this is the heart of the matter here. Then when Haman went forth that day joyful and with a glad heart, when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, he stood not up nor moved for him, for he was full of indignation against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Mordecai refrained himself, and when he came home, he sat and called for his friends and Zeresh, his wife. And Haman told them of his glory, of his riches, and the multitude of his children, and all the things wherein the king had promoted him, and how he had advanced him above all the princes and servants of the king. Now that's, that's a, boy, he's really got it all, everything. Haman said, moreover, yea, Esther the, yes, Esther the queen did not, did let no man come with the king under the banquet that she prepared, but myself, and tomorrow I am invited with her also with the king. He's the top man. But here's the crux of the matter in verse 14. Then said Zeresh, his wife, and all his friend, let a gallows be made of fifty cubits, that tomorrow speak unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged, that thou may be merry and and be hanged there, and now I go with the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman and caused the gallows to be made. He decided to kill Haman. He had all these things going for him, everything, and he ends up going on this dangerous plot because he wasn't content with them. He, there was one thing he was not happy. This one person would not bow down to him. He wasn't content. Well, make a long story short, we're not going to go through this. It ends up everything backfires for him, and he's the one who's hanged on those gallows. You know, some people, you could have all these things, and you can still not be content. The idea we need to look at is uh, the biblical definition of, con of discontentment. And the biblical definition, Steve read that there. Uh, let's go to Philippians 4, 11 through 13 again. Philippians 4, 11 through 13. Now that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatever state I am, therefore, to be content. This is the Apostle Paul talking. I know both, both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I am instructed to be both full and to be hungry, to abound and to suffer. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. He said, whatever my condition, with Christ on my side, I can deal with it. I can handle it. I can be content. Contentment is something we all should strive for. But there's a caveat in this and a warning. There are some things contentment is not. And I'm going to deal with those first. Contentment is not an excuse to 
grow or mature, not to grow or mature. You need to always be growing and maturing. Second Peter 3.18 it says, But grow in the grace of knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Hebrews 5.11-12, Paul said, They ought to be teachers, but instead needed to be taught again the elementary principles of God. In your religious walk, in your religious life, you shouldn't be content to sit in one spot. And that's the same way in your physical, worldly life. You should not be content to sit where you're at. You don't have to be, you need to be better at your job or better at whatever you do, better at your personality. You need to be improving yourself constantly. That's the Christian way. And as I said, in the church, it's not, in the church, contentment is not an excuse to tolerate sin and error. Many churches are content to let discretions and sin, plain sin, continue because they're tolerating. You know, in 1 Corinthians 5, 12, the church at Corinth talks about a man who'd had his father's wife. And then in 1 Corinthians 5, 13, Paul says, Remove that wicked man from among yourselves. Many churches are content to just roll along like we are, even though there's wickedness and evil there. You know what happens? Eventually everybody notices it, and some of them start doing the same thing. You can't be content with just... Contentment is not an excuse to not mature or to enforce the laws. Improve yourself. John and John... Second John 10, 11 warned about anyone not bringing the doctrine of Christ with them was not to be admitted into fellowship. We can't be content with what letting anyone in, although that's the easy way. And I want to talk about contentment. When church gets content, sometimes they veil it. They like different words than, you know, we got some sinful people in this congregation. They just say, oh, well, we're trying to be patient and we're being tolerant is what we're doing. You can't do that. Church cannot all, ever be content, I don't think. The, the church is content in doing God's will the way he wants it done. But it is not an excuse to continue to grow and mature and be better. Contentment is not to remain in sin. Paul in Hebrews 12, 1 says, We must lay aside every encumbrance and that in which is easily entangles us. Just because you're content in what you're doing, if it isn't lined up with God, doesn't work. That's no excuse to say you're content. Paul condemned the idea that they continue in sin so that grace may agree, uh, increase in Romans 6, verses 1 through 2. They thought that, hey, there's grace, so I can keep on sinning, which seems ludicrous to us, but there were people who believed that. And even today, there are people in the world that believe that, that Christ's blood covered it all. I can continue sinning. No, you can't be content in that sense of the word. Content is not an excuse not to work hard. Ecclesiastes 9 10 says, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Whatever your job is, whatever your work, whether it's in your religious walk or in your worldly walk, do it with all your might. Hebrews 4.11 said, Therefore, let us be diligent to enter into that rest. He's talking about our heavenly rest there someday. We need to be working at it. You know, in whatever we do, we can't be content in just where we're at. If uh, I was a new Christian, like our young man back there, and we said, well, you can uh, do the scripture reading every week. But if he was content to do that 20 years from now, you need to be growing. Every one of us needs to be. I'm still growing. You know, even in my job in farming, I learn new stuff every day. I mean, you've got to. Patrick, in your teaching, you probably learn new stuff every day. 
new rules, new regulations, new ways to teach, new things about kids you didn't. Steve, in construction business, I bet you learned something all the time. They brought you a new piece of equipment out there, a different piece or some other way to do something. We've all got, Chris, you too with trucks. I could get in your truck probably and think I was in a spaceship, wouldn't have an idea, but I used to know how to get in one of those and drive it. I wouldn't now, but I mean, we're always learning and improving ourselves and saying you're content, that doesn't allow, being content doesn't allow you to sit still. It's not an excuse. I spent more time here today, I believe, talking about what contentment isn't rather than is, but we'll get to the is part in a little bit here. It's not an excuse not to be a good steward. You know, you can't sit still. You need to be doing stuff. God has given us so many gifts and so many good things. I think sometimes we tend to focus on the bad things in our lives and the difficult things and the hard things, but there are a lot of good things. You know, I got up out of bed this morning. There's a lot of people around my age that didn't get up out of bed today. A lot of people don't have the mobility I have. We've got a lot of gifts. And as you can look at me, I've been eating pretty good. Hey, we got it pretty good now. A lot of it, some of us have some difficulties and problems. But we got a lot of good things given to us, too, even our worst situations. In Genesis 128, God said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Just because you're content, you don't sit still. You've got to keep moving. May not be quite the what you want, but you've got to keep moving and trying. Peter in 1 Peter 4.10 says, Serving one another is good stewards by the grace of God. Now, we've, continued, we've hit a few of the points of what contentment isn't. Some people are content to just sit where they're at, but no. And same way with churches. Sometimes they're content to just stay stalled in the same old track. We need to be growing in many ways. And us, we as individuals need to grow. We, contentment is not setting still is what he's talking about. Look at Paul. He was on the move for over 30 years. He traveled over 20,000, I believe it's 20,000 miles on foot. They were able to track just from what it tells us in the Bible, his routes. Over 20,000 miles on foot. Do you know what the bottom of your feet would look like if we, you walked 20,000 miles? And just That's just what we know about. But I'm going to deal with what contentment is now. Contentment is humbly submitting to the will of God. Second John 9 says, Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teachings of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in his teachings has both the Father and the Son. I think we, a lot of people, we can find our contentment in God if you want to. I really think the most content people are Christian people who have devoted themselves totally to it. In fact, I don't know if you can really ever be content much without God. Because you know that there's going to be a debt you pay someday. All of us do to God or nature, whatever you want to call it. We're all going to die. And if you don't have God, I don't think you can be content with that. And when you're thinking about it, you'll be thinking about it every day of your life. Death's a terrible thing. But I think submitting to God's will will help get you more contentment. One thing that will make you more content is patiently dealing with circumstances beyond our control. There's all kinds of things that happen in our lives that we have absolutely no control over. There's things that are going to happen, and they've happened in every one of your lives out there that you have no control over. And you just got to patiently deal with it. That's the only way you can be content. You got to look at it and say, okay, here's this. I didn't get these cards dealt to me, but this is the hand I've got to play. You just have to de be content to deal with that in the best way you can. We have to realize that. And I don't think many, a lot of people do realize that some things we just can't correct. Some things just aren't going to be the way you want it. You can't control everything in your life. None of us can. Jesus said in Matthew 6.34, 
not to worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. This is not about, don't worry about, don't do nothing, just relax. No, no. He said, don't worry about it. Tomorrow will take care of itself. The worries of today are enough. Worry about tomorrow when it gets here. He doesn't tell us to not think about tomorrow, because look at what James tells us in James 4, 13 and 16. He, I, won't, I won't quote that, but that's where it is, James 4, 13 and 16. James tells us that we should plan for the future, but we must ex accept that which happens. He talks about how tomorrow you may plan to go to a certain city and trade and deal, but who he also says who knows what will happen. Chris may get out on the road tomorrow, and he's got plans of where he's going to be, and then that old truck breaks down. We all have, but we still have to plan. you got to plan on getting up in the morning. you got to plan on going down that road. But we don't have control over a lot of things, and we got to be content with that and just deal patiently with it. I see some people who get pretty mad sometimes when things don't go their way. And you want to know something? It doesn't help. Not one bit. Try to deal with patience. And you know, if you look at the word patience, it's used a whole lot of times in the New Testament. Our circumstances may not be what we intended, but we've got to be content with what, what they are and deal with it. Contentment's graciously, accept, graciously accepting what blessings God provides. Paul said in 1 Timothy 6, 8, If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. You know, most of us here in this country have food and we have clothing. And if you don't, it's probably there's a reason you don't have it. Uh, I mean, you're probably spending a little money on something else that you maybe shouldn't, you know. Uh, there may be people, but I tell you what, I, I'm sure that if anybody come up to any member in here and said, "I'm hungry, can I? Will you give me some? Buy me something to eat at the store right here?" You'd go in and get them a bag. Of, you'd give them something to fill their belly, wouldn't you? I don't think there's one of you wouldn't do that. Now you may not give them money. I probably wouldn't, but I'd get them something to eat if they're hungry. Sometimes we have to be content with the idea that when we do right, we're going to have some consequences that we don't like because of it. And we've got to accept that in part of our, as part of our being content. 2 Corinthians 12.10, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, I am well content with weakness, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake, for wherein I am weak, then I am strong. Sometimes we're going to be put into difficulties and problems because of our Christian belief. But I think sometimes when you accept those challenges that are actually weaknesses, you think are weaknesses, it'll make you stronger. When you stand up the first time to a bully, it's hard. Second time may not be quite so hard. If you stand up enough, you may not have any teeth left, but eventually he'll leave you alone, I think. Probably, hopefully. But you know what? You need you need to stand up to the difficulties. And I think I could I think you can you know, if you take the coward's way out, there's no satisfaction, there's no contentment in that, the way I look at it. I believe I'd rather stand my ground for what's right and take the, the beating and be content with that I did stand up for what was right than to run and have to deal with that in my conscience every day from then on in. You're going to be laughed at and mocked a little, and that's just the way it is when you're preaching. What are the biggest causes for discontentment? I have two things that I think are big ones, and there are probably some others. One of them, we all crave the approval of men, and we have a fear of rejection by men. We want to be accepted. Paul in Galatians 1.10 said, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? 
For if I have yet pleased men, I shall not be the servant of Christ. We like and want the approval of men. You know, that's one good thing, though, about the, why we come together all the time, is to support each other. We're not alone. We know there's others like us, and we can support each other, provide comfort for each other, because we do need other men's support and approval. Many people crave approval more than others, though. And rejection is hard, especially young people. It's hard for young people, kids and all. 1 Timothy 6.6 6 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. Sometimes people have a low esteem. There are many causes for that. But if you have a low opinion of yourself, you can change that you got to remember, you're one of God's creatures. You need to value yourself like God values you. Genesis 127. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created in him. Male and female created him them. God created you in his own image. Now, can you imagine how important you are that he created you in his own image? He didn't create the animals in his own image or anything else. That, that's really important. You've got to stop and think, hey, I have value, I have worth. No matter what the world thinks of you, no matter what your situation. You, you may be of low esteem, but you shouldn't be because whatever your plight in this world you are valued by God. One of the things I believe that caused people discontent, and I won't go too deep into this, is the fact of greed. Some people never have enough, and they're always looking for more. And it's pretty easy to fall into that. All I can tell you is you're not going to take one thing out of this world with you, not one thing. Solomon once said, and this is a paraphrase, who knows how the next man will deal with what I've left. If you look at the great fortunes that are made and the wealth, somebody down the line always throws it away and squanders it. If you think you're going to leave it to have a great name or something, it'll be squandered sometime or destroyed, I promise you. It always happens. Look at the history of man. Greed, money. You're not going to take any of it with us. Be content with what you have. Sometimes we need to take the light of attention off ourselves and shine it on others to be content. Help others find contentment in Christ. Help others. Listen to their problems and give godly advice. Let me tell you, that's a little harder to do sometimes than, than you actually than say it. It's pretty easy, you know, listen to others. I've had people, you know, sometimes when they start in all the problems, they don't quit. I mean, they go on and on and on. And sometimes you go, is this ever going to end? But uh, we should listen anyways and try to give a godly advice. Sometimes the godly advice is just the same I gave you. We have to do what it best with what we got and deal with circumstances. And I know it's hard sometimes to do that. If you look at some of the lives of the contented men, I consider Jesus and Paul in that vein that uh, they didn't have it easy, but they said they were contented, I believe. Well, that's kind of my lesson on contentment there. Something every man or woman has to find for themselves. But just remember that uh, I believe contentment with godliness is the very best way. You may be content for a little while with worldly things, but eventually you'll want something else. We always offer an invitation for anybody who isn't a Christian who wants to be one to come forward at the end of a sermon. And we also offer that same invitation to anybody who has problems or difficulties or something we can help you with to come forward at any time. And maybe we can help you with that. And for those of you who are listening out on the Internet land there, you know, if you decide you'd like to become a Christian or you'd like to learn more about it, you can contact us anytime. Uh, and we're not, we're not pressuring people. 
when you when we you contact us, we won't pressure you. You know, this is a free will thing, and you've got to make it up in your mind that you want to do this. You've got to be sure in your own heart. That's the message. If you'd like to become a Christian or have a problem, come forward and sing this next song. Thank you. This morning, it's been left prepared. You can make your way forward as we sing 449. 449. second and fourth verses and then ask Brother Chris to lead us in a word of prayer. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know the same the
to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to come together again to hear another portion of thy word. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who went through the cross for our sins at this time. We ask that you come to that we come to you in prayer with a repentant heart and mindset of any wrongdoings that may have separated us from thee. That our prayers may be heard at this time. I pray that the lesson that was spoken before us here this evening of contentment that we would apply to our lives to help us become better stewards to thee and be better stewards out here in the world in which we live among those who are lost as well as towards one another. I pray that we will always be thankful for the things that you have provided for us here on earth, food, shelter, clothing. And that we will continue to trust you for anything that we may be lacking. Continue to be with those who couldn't make it here this evening. For whatever the reason may be that you will continue to watch over them. Be with those of us who will be traveling this upcoming week. That you will keep us safe on our jobs. Continue to be with the new brothers and sisters in Christ here and afar, that us as older Christians, brothers, sisters in Christ, that we will continue to be an encouragement to them as well. Praise the name of Jesus' name. Amen.